As we move into our section on Brenton Woods and the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, I think we should initially cover just a little brief history of international monetary regimes. So here we're just going to look at some of the basics from the gold standard through the Great Depression. The gold standard beginning in 1870 and lasting into about 1914, this occurred during the first big wave of globalization. And again, these stable currencies helped to facilitate trust because it eliminated uh, currency risk. And that, of course, facilitated not only trade in goods and services between countries, but also international capital flows. These sorts of things led to a global economic boom, also associated with the first big wave of globalization. And during this period of time, there was fairly open capital mobility, of course, to facilitate trade in goods, services, and capital. And we were dealing with pure commodity currencies here. So every country that was participating in this gold standard would tie the value of its currency to gold. And of course, it had to have adequate gold in its treasury in order to credibly back that peg. So if there was adequate gold in the treasuries, then of course, we were dealing with a pure commodity currency where bills represented actual gold. So accepting a bill uh, was as good as gold. Each of the currencies was pegged to gold that was held in respective treasuries. And London was at the center of the financial world, clearing international payments, monitoring and accounting the system, so on and so forth. At the time, London was also the, the hegemon, sort of militarily and also financially. Imbalances that did occur were settled in movements of actual gold, transfers of gold from one country to another. So how did it break down? Well, there was obviously value from having the gold standard facilitating trade and investment, trust and financial and economic integration between countries, which oftentimes leads to peace. But not always does it guarantee peace, and World War I broke out. Now, countries would either have uh, two options. On the one hand, they could refuse to print money and maintain the value of the currency in the commodity gold, or they could print money necessary to fight war efforts and protect the fact that they were a sovereign nation. And so this is oftentimes the reason for a loss of price stability, whether it is the collapse of a gold standard or simply the onset of inflation, which is political concerns oftentimes pertaining to armed conflict. So the need for monetary autonomy in order to finance spending during World War I led to the printing of currency in such large quantities that it could no longer be credibly pegged to gold. Without this anchor to gold, currencies became fiat, no longer commodity currencies, but really paper only, decreed by the government as legal tender, which is what fiat is. And the international system of cooperation broke down, exchange rates began to float, and the first big wave of globalization ended with the resolution of World War One. We then enter into the 1920s, and if you're looking at this photo, you might be familiar with it from Hollywood movies or your own personal history. This is the jazz era. These are flappers, and they are party animals, right? So this is the party. This is the Roaring Twenties. We associate the Roaring Twenties with jazz and speakeasies and flappers and Leonardo DiCaprio in The Great Gatsby. We were dealing with fiat currencies and loose monetary policy, flexible exchange rates, and these combinations led to bubbles in the stock market. These bubbles in the stock market persisted through the 1920s, leading many, even highly educated economists, to believe that the boom would always continue and that the high asset prices would, would really always be there. And so as the stock market boomed, a rising tide floats all boats, and many, many, many individuals were 
worried about missing out on these rising asset values and plowed their money into the stock market. And for a short period of time, their belief in rising prices would be validated by others' beliefs in rising prices. As people continued to buy in, the stock market bubble continued to grow. But as we all know, what comes up must come down, and eventually that would have to occur with the roaring 20s. The party would have to suffer its hangover. Now, Fisher, a famous Nobel laureate economist, wrote a paper at the period of time saying that stock prices had reached permanently high plateaus, essentially publishing a statement that said, ah, what goes up doesn't need to come down. Fisher lost a fortune in the market because eventually there was a clash with reality. And that crash was the 1929 Black Tuesday crash in which in a very short period of time the stock market lost nearly all of its value and had hit a market low by 1932 eviscerating 90% of the value of investments. The irrational optimists who believe that simply maintaining a positive attitude about stock prices would perennially keep them high had, of course, a rude awakening when the reality of those values was realized. Now, many people lost entire fortunes in the stock market, and institutions were obliterated, damaged. This, of course, led to balance sheet effects that were problematic. Now, as we talked about in previous lectures, we noted that uh, because of competition in the banking sector, many commercial banks had invested their depositors' assets in the risky securities of the stock market up through 1929, thinking that they could earn very, very high rates of return on those assets and become extremely profitable and successful banks. And for a while, that strategy worked out well, high risk, high return. But on Black Tuesday, that strategy reversed itself in a black swan type of event that decimated whatever fortunes had been acquired, proving them, in essence, to be of fiction, if you will. As the collapse of the stock market created a rash of investor pessimism and a negative wealth effect on the part of consumers, the U.S. economy dipped into a recession that would become a depression. Exacerbating that depression was, of course, the collapse in the U.S. money supply, which, of course, was not orchestrated by the Federal Reserve, but was a consequence of widespread banking solvency crises and also liquidity crises on the part of banks as well. As depositors started to question whether or not their bank was invested in the market up to 1929, they began to have, of course, runs on banks creating the kind of liquidity crises that we discussed earlier in class. And as the economy slipped Great Depression, we saw unemployment skyrocket. There are different numbers on this, and those estimates, of course, vary because we're dealing with a period of time, 1929, 33, 32, where statistics were not very well developed in terms of their gathering potential in the United States. Some estimates place the Great Depression at 30% unemployment, others at 23% unemployment, unemployment. The most often cited ones that I see place it at around 25% unemployment at its high. But needless to say, the United States slipped into a depression where there was double-digit unemployment between 15 and 25%. And the interesting t- thing to note about that level of unemployment is that the economy failed to be self-correcting. And that high level of unemployment or surplus in the labor market lasted for a decade. A decade of lost opportunity, a decade of poverty, a decade of immiseration, a decade of desperation and social turmoil in the United States as people were unable to support themselves even if they were skilled, willing, able, and in fact desperate to work. The cartoon from the time shows a line of bedraggled men and of course the last man in the line is walking up saying, hey, excuse me, buddy. Uh, Is this a bread line or is this a run on the bank? And that, I think, exemplifies the level of confusion and desperation that was taking place at the time. An absolutely socially devastating crisis. From 1929 to 1940 is where we typically 
place the Great Depression. Attempts were made during this period of time to reconstitute the gold standard, try to create price stability, try to get international trade and investment flows going again, but countries refused to cooperate with collective organization, even though that collective organization would have been in their best interests. Instead, they pursued their own national interests instead of that of the collective. And this in and of itself, this defensive turning within nationalist posture, created a set of policies that actually deepened and prolonged the Great Depression. This was not just a American depression, this was a global depression, and it triggered a wave of all-out economic warfare. Things like protectionism, trying to prevent foreign goods from entering your country in hopes that whatever demand was still existing in your country would be circulated towards domestic employment. Of course, we know there are gains from trade in not only efficiency, but bringing down the cost of goods to consumers, which can enhance their standard of living. And, of course, all of these economic benefits were eliminated from the protectionist phase that we went into uh, in the Great Depression. We also saw something called beggar thy neighbor policies. Keynes called it beggar thy neighbor policies. And this is essentially competitive devaluations of your exchange rate. The idea here is that you want to take more global trade. And so what you do is you depreciate your exchange rate so that it's cheaper than other countries' exchange rates in hopes that global demand gets steered toward you and you're able to support domestic production and domestic employment by creating an artificially weak exchange rate. Well, what happens here is this is a beggar thy neighbor policy. What you're doing is you're exporting unemployment through depreciating your currency. Now, you can imagine what your trade rival's response to this is going to be well, they're going to depreciate their currency below yours. And then the other rival is going to depreciate their currency even further, and then you're going to have to depreciate your currency even further. And so what you get into is a competitive round of competitive dev devaluations or competitive depreciations through this beggar-thy-neighbor policy. What that does is it starts to eviscerate the value of currencies globally because, of course, you get inflation when you see a depreciation and inflation makes the value of money worth less and whatever money you had in your pockets from that daily job or leftover as wealth is now not able to buy very much. So this short-sighted, protectionist, nationalistic, sort of you know protect sovereign interest kind of policy, us against them, flew in the face of all economic wisdom about how you would recover from something like this and prolonged and deepened this state of misery for the United States and for countries around the world. This called not only instability and prolonged the depression, but it also created competitive divisiveness between countries who are now competing over increasingly scarce employment opportunities. And of course, wherever you see scarce, scarcity, you see conflict. As these policies generated increasing scarcity, the heat and the level of conflict between individuals inside a country, between classes inside a country, between demographic groups inside a country, and between countries across the world started to become exacerbated. This sign, I think, is fantastic. Jobless men, keep going. We can't take care of our own. This is not a sign at the border with Mexico. This is a sign between small towns as men roamed from town to town, desperately seeking some kind of employment. The kind of nationalistic, protectionist, us-against-them thing became a toxic mindset that started to take over national, local, state, and city ways of dealing with not foreigners, but other Americans that you now viewed as a threat to your prosperity. Essentially, moving towards breaking up the united feature of the United States and turn conflict within the country, breaking down unity and further exacerbating any sort of cooperative solution to the problems that were prolonging the Great Depression. Sounds familiar.
After the Great Depression, Mariner S. Eccles was called back to Washington. You'll remember Mariner S. Eccles was able to stave off a bank run at First Security Bank in the Intermountain West of the United States. And he was helping to become the principal architect of banking reform, the Banking Act of 1933, also known, more commonly known, as Glass-Steagall. We talked about this a little bit before. He really put the Fed into a modern era of central banking, giving the Fed not only the powers, the mandate, and the duty to act as a stabilizing force for banking and banking sector activity in the United States. And some of the key institutional reforms that were required to create the next 50, 60 years of banking stability are well known and they are listed here. The first one was that we needed to have a lender of last resort to bail out banks if there was liquidity problems for short-run financing issues. And so the Fed became a credible, guaranteed lender of last resort through the function of the discount window, if you will, discount lending window. He also created the FOMC, the Federal Open Markets Committee. And as you may know from your money and banking classes or your macro classes, the FOMC operates out of New York and makes decisions about bond purchases and sales designed to influence the federal funds rate, thereby helping to anchor interest rates throughout the economy. And so here the Fed takes not only the power, but also the duty to help to stabilize interest rates throughout the economy through the FOMC. It gives the Federal Reserve meaningful monetary policies to work with in terms of achieving economic targets such as price stability and the reduction of unemployment. This sets the Federal Reserve up as a potentially powerful economic tool rather than an institution that sits on the sideline and regulates the amount of money in the economy. Now they have the potential to pay an active and Keynesian style role in trying to bring the economy back to some sort of health and um, efficiency, if you will. Again, with the Banking Act and Glass-Steagall, we get FDIC. You may remember FDIC as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And this was designed to eliminate the fear and panic that would be generating bank runs. FDIC insurance now insuring up to $250,000 per account if you are banking at an FDIC-insured institution. And not all of them are. You'll have to make note of that when you're choosing a bank. He also uh, put in something called the firewall, which was the separation of commercial and investment banking. The idea here was that you would prevent uh, widespread systemic solvency crises and contain solvency crises to the investment banking sector since commercial banks were forbidden from dealing in securities at all. That way you could keep a risky stock market, but you could prevent the volatility of that stock market from translating into widespread banking crises. You might see investment banking crises, but you wouldn't see that manifest as a widespread nationwide commercial banking crisis, which would then consequently have a dramatic impact on the money supply, as it did in the Great Depression. And one of the other big pillars of stability was, of course, to prevent banking competition. Regulation Q put interest rate ceilings on what you could pay depositors. This meant that you couldn't poach deposit funds away from other banks by raising the deposit interest rate. If you did that, of course, you could get more volume of deposits for which you could purchase assets and earn profit. But because that would create a squeeze on your profit spread, since you have to pay out larger costs to depositors to secure your investment funds, you would then have to roll into riskier and riskier asset classes in order to maintain a profit rate as that profit spread narrowed with high deposit rates. This, of course, would mean that competition led to increasing withholding of risk by individual institutions. As other institutions followed the same path to profit, you would see systemic risk throughout the system rise, increasing the likelihood of a system-wide crisis. So Mariner S. Eccles was taking a page out of what would be become the Hyman Minsky financial instability process, thinking that there was something inherently instable about competition within the financial sector. Whereas we usually associate competition with efficiency and stability and innovation and prosperity in the product goods market. 
I want Samsung competing with Apple as viciously as possible to bring me better phones with better services at lower costs. And if any of those dominant players start to overcharge, I want a third party to come in and say I can produce this product just as good if not better at lower costs to steal market share. So generally speaking, we think of competition as being one of the key mechanisms that drives efficiency, innovation, and productivity in markets. Hyman Minsky, Mariner S, and Glass-Steagall saw that perhaps that's true in all sectors of the economy except for particularly finance, where the risk is that competition and unfettered, unregulated market dealings lead to excess volatility, excess risk-taking, and recurrent crises. The question becomes whether or not that attitude towards domestic banking and financial sectors should be the same attitude that we have towards international capital. And if that's not the case, and the lessons learned from domestic financial markets don't extend to global financial markets, why? Why would they be so much different? So these are things to think about as we move forward and we build the kind of history and trajectory towards the modern international financial and monetary system, which is, of course, predicated upon the preeminence, the hegemony, if you will, of the U.S. dollar and U.S. financial institutions. So we're going to build that now as we move forward into the future, but I did want to make sure that we had a little brief history with some good economics lessons about fiat currencies, commodity currencies, and banking crises, prolonged recessions. So now we're up to about World War II, and the next couple lectures are going to build hegemony out of World War II and the political aftermath of World War II. I hope you enjoyed this short snippet of a lecture. I hope it was informative for you, and we'll move on to the next one shortly.